we can't even breathe the air in Delhi anymore. All the water that we are drinking has to go through RO, reverse osmosis. You are stuck in traffic for one hour, idling pollution. It's slow genocide. Ten years ago, the Living Planet Report, which is done by a whole lot of organizations, IUC and WWF, showed that 29% of the species in rivers, oceans, and land were on the verge of extinction. In 10 years, that number has gone up to 52%. Strangely enough, during the same time, you look at the second data over there, that 1% of the richest people in the world own 35% of the wealth, and now it's over 50%. Some people say it's 65 So, it's not looking like a very fair world at the moment, okay? And what has happened in the last 50 years is that we have the Arctic melting, we have an ozone hole, we have global warming, and we've lost 98% of the fish stocks in the ocean. So it looks a little bit grim. This is what has happened over the last 50 years. The question is that something is going very wrong, that's clear. And the whole point is, can we put our finger on it? Do we know what's going wrong? What seems to be the case in the last 200 years, we've been industrializing. And today, we have our all global citizens, as you know. We have a global free market. The free market works on profit. How do you get more profits? You need more sales. How do you get more sales? You need to have more products. And how do you get more products? Technology. So technology has become captive to the market. And that's why every two years you have to, your phone becomes not so smart and you junk it. And your other apparatus also, your computer becomes not so smart. But where is all this junk going? I mean, this is all downloaded on the planet. Okay, the technology cemetery is the biggest cemetery of all. And it's for all of us to see. And why are we doing this? Because the market tells us that each of one has to have one of each. All right? I mean, that's the only way to describe it once you know somebody has it. Now, if this is the case, it's not only that all this waste is downloaded on the planet, but you have to make waste off the planet to make this apparatus. I've got some of it on me. Anyway, so once you do that, you find that we are gradually working our way to extinction. On the other hand, the biggest production system that we have is nature. And there is no waste in nature. Everything is recycled. Okay? While we've been doing invention for the sake of inventing, driven by the market, we've completely forgotten, we've learned everything from nature, we've completely forgotten it. Okay, that was the bad news. Now we have to get to something which is like a solution, right? I already said that nature's production system doesn't have any waste. So maybe there's a clue there. Can we do technology which is natural cycle technology where there is no non-biodegradable waste? How do we deal with the planet? Three billion years of life, of evolution, it must be doing something right and it's steady. Whereas in 50 years, we have managed to knock off at least a third of the planet. So if we go back, what I'm going to share with you it's one or two ground examples because there's not time for much more. And they are going to concern you in Delhi. Okay. So let me start with the first one. So this is the floodplain of the river Yamna. And I want to show you what is the floodplain. The floodplain has seven kilometers of sand. 30 million years of the river flowing down from the Himalayas has brought in silt during the monsoon and flooded the plains. And the river has shifted course. And all Himalayan rivers are 7 to 20 kilometers wide of sand and almost 100 meters deep. And look what sand can do. So you start with equal amount of water, you start pouring the water and see how much water there is in the sand. We found that the floodplain is nothing but the perfect repository for water. 40% of it almost is water. And you can draw up to 15% of it. The amazing thing is, that it's all good water because it's all recharged naturally by the monsoon rain and by flooding. Flooding comes late in the season when 
most of the pollution has been taken away. Although the river, as you know, is a complete mess, the floodplain water we found is very good. This is a typical picture of the floodplain. And all you've got to do is put a grid of two wells at, say, one kilometer from each other and extract the water. And the floodplain, being an aquifer which is seven kilometers wide and deep and hundreds of kilometers long, brings the water right back. You can push it as much as you want. But we're not doing that. We have to be very careful that we don't use anything more than is recharged. That is the basic principle when you're using this evolutionary resource that was given to you by evolution in millions of years. If you overexploit it, the pollution will come in. If you overdo it, you can finish off the aquifer. So you have to be very careful. We've done this all the time. But it is so much better than getting water from the Tehri Dam 300 kilometers away. It's crazy because you make a huge dent in the Himalayan ecology. So right now, the Delhi Jal Board is doing a project on this. And from next year, you will be getting water from this project. And it's going to finally give 100 million cubic meters a year, which is enough for about one and a quarter million people or one and a half million people. It's a project in the northern part, which is undisturbed right now, of the Yamna floodplain. And it amounts to $250 million of water at tanker value. So this is not a joke. It gives you an enormous economic benefit, a health benefit, and it preserves the river. So this is what the model does. Natural storage, natural recharge, self-sustaining. It's perennial, non-invasive, and it can be used in hundreds of cities in India, in China, even in Iraq, the Tigris and the Euphrates. So I want to give you one more example, that if you look at the ridge in Delhi, the ridge can provide you water for 16 million people. And if you look at, sell it at 10 rupees, it's mineral water because it falls on the forest, picks up the nutrients, goes to the rock. You just have to pick it up, two liters a day or three liters for everybody. And it can give you more than a billion dollars a year of non-invasive use. So I'm just giving you two examples. There are many. There are windmills which are made by a gentleman called Mr. Seishadri on the coast in Chennai, which are completely biodegradable. And so should be solar cells and batteries, otherwise we have a huge problem. So just gives you some answers on how we can change our scheme of living. That's what this is about. So this was the welcome news, that you can change it if you want, but you have to work creatively and you have to work hard. So now I'm going to take you back 2,500 years and talk about the Buddha. Not as a religious person, not as a spiritual master, as a quintessential scientist. And I'm going to take, bring you right back to the fact that democracy and conservation today are troubled, very noble but troubled ideals. So I'm going to talk about democracy and the three identities. So the first identity is a personal one. And most of us have now democracy has contracted to our personal benefits, our privileges, our freedoms, our rights. We don't think about anything else. Because most of us are in the position where we can't think about anything else. But world over, it's become selfish. So you all start equal. But you have a larger identity, which is the society. And you have a still larger identity, which is the habitat where you live, which is the planet. How do you work with them? If you start equal with one vote for each person, very soon it's unequal. The rich have got richer, the more powerful have got more powerful, the military nations have become the dominant nations. Everything becomes inequitous, it becomes unequal, as you've seen. Laws can never keep up with technology. You need an ethical value system. Why the Buddha? 2500 years ago, the Buddha introduced democracy in nine kingdoms. It was called Sangha. And after that, he realized that you have to take the responsibility, so he introduced Dharma, which was exactly an ethical value system. But you must remember that this is society. So individuals can prey on the society. But the society's consumption is zooming up. The society's population is also going up. And that preys on the planet. So you can't finish off the planet, otherwise that's the end of the story. How do you do this? So the planet, as far as the planet is concerned, 
2,500 years ago, there was something called Ahimsa, which is respect for all of creation because you need it to sustain the planet. That was also there. But it wasn't needed. It was just a philosophical revelation. Today, we need it very badly. I'm leaving you with the thought that these three identities, the personal, true to yourself, the societal, to have an equable society, and to have a healthy planet, all three identities must be non-invasive to each other. The rest is up to you. Thank you.